there, everyone. I'm Lauren Borchardt, Director of Historical Programs at the U.S. Capitol Historical Society. Thanks for joining us today for this edition of our Scholar Series. Today we have with us Deborah Hansen, and she'll be speaking about apotheosis from ancient Rome to the U.S. Capitol Rotunda. So we can't wait to hear more about that very famous painting on the inside of the dome. Oh, not a painting. I will get reprimanded. It's a fresco. <laughs> so we'll hear more about that shortly. I will turn it over now to Jane Campbell, President and CEO of the U.S. Capitol Historical Society. Thank you, Lauren, and thank you for all of the behind the scenes work that you do to make these series possible. Uh, we are delighted, as always, to have you joining us for the Scholar Series. Um, the United States Capitol Historical Society is able to provide these because of the generous support of our donors and members. And we appreciate all those of you who are members and donors. Um, and for those of you who haven't taken that opportunity yet, golden moment, uh, no opportunity now, like now in the present. Um, we really appreciate your support and we appreciate the support of those of you who share the information about these series with other people who may not know about the society and gives them an opportunity to learn not just about the society but about the capital as a symbol of freedom particularly as we coming on to the fourth of july and the anniversary of our country uh, we are reminded that the mission of the united states capitol historical society is to create an informed patriotism worthy of the founders of this country that being said, our featured expert is Deborah Hansen. Uh, Dr. Hansen is an assistant professor at the Virginia Commonwealth University, an art historian specializing in American art and architecture and the visual culture of the 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, we've been fortunate to work with her on a number of occasions because she has a special interest in the Art of the Capitol, and we have been able to work with her as a, uh, a fellow with the United States Capitol Historical Society. Dr. Hansen, we are honored to have you with us uh, and have you make this presentation. We are so interested as we go to the Capitol and look up in the, in the ceiling, in the top, to the apotheosis what is the story about how that got from Rome to the United States Capitol? Dr. Hansen. So I wanted to just mention that by way of introduction, um, how I came to the topic, because I've been doing quite a bit of research into multiple aspects of the rotunda. And one thing that I did notice that was, was that there had been a lot of uh, scholarship on the formal technical and iconographic programs of Brumidi's fresco. But there really had not been much sustained examination of the actual event um, that is pictured in the fresco or its historical lineage. So as it happened, this topic was a good fit for the Historical Society's forthcoming volume um, <clears throat> on Roman influences on the art and architecture of the capital. So today I'll be drawing on that chapter, uh, the chapter from that volume, to explore a selection of ideas and images related to apotheosis in classical Rome, in modern America, and in the capital rotunda. And so the talk today is divided into um, subtopics, so I'll just give you the title um, of the section and then we'll proceed from there. So the first section is on the significance of Roman models in the process of nation building. So seeking new, which we mean non-British cultural models to express the new nation's abstract ideals in visible form and to assert its legitimacy on the international stage the founders turned to the architecture and political structures of ancient Rome <clears throat> as a source. Knowledgeable regarding the classics, they sought to, quote, begin again, begin anew the work of the ancient Republicans while heeding the lessons of their fall and guarding against the same fate 
in their own country. So they were looking to the past for behavioral as well as political and architectural models. And Washington, Jefferson, Adams, and their peers all saw in <clears throat> Cincinnati, Cicero, Cato, and other heroic figures from Rome's early history, the virtues vital to a republic, which they sought to emulate in their own lives and instill in their fellow citizens. So Washington, as we know, was particularly identified with Cincinnati. Uh, the general called up to defeat Rome's enemies, but then who willingly resigned his commission to return to civilian life. And Washington was also very much identified with Cato, uh, the senator, the Roman senator who died opposing Julius Caesar's rise to power. So within the context of 18th century neoclassicism, the selective use of Roman uh, references prove vital to constructing an American iconography and to the task of nation building that that iconography supported. And so just to note, there was also wide public knowledge of the classics in this, um, <clears throat> in this era. And it was part of the major curriculums at all educational levels. And I also want to mention the popularity of Joseph Addison's play, Cato, um, which really drew large colonial audiences. So it was sort of like the Hamilton, I guess, um, of colonial America. Um, also, I did want to note the founders' uh, disdain for Julius Caesar. He was one Roman leader that they particularly railed against. And they warned very strongly um, to not follow the, ex the example Caesar had set, but quote, to ex exercise eternal vigilance against cunning, ambitious individuals who seek to advance their own power at the expense of the Republic. So the next section um, has to do with the Capitol and the Capitolium. And the derivation of both words is, is Latin, of course, and the word caput meaning head. So while the US Capitol's architectural references to ancient Rome are well known, other aspects of the building reiterate the same connection. And here we see a scale model. It's completely conjectural in terms of, let me get the pointer. Here we go. And this is, um, again, a conjectural reconstruction of what the Capitolium looked like, okay? And the word Capitolium actually referred both to the temple of Jupiter uh, Opetus Maximus that we see here and its elevated site, which is the Capitoline Hill um, in Rome. And so like the Capitol, um, in Washington, our capital, both the uh, Capitolium was also conceived as a sacred center of a nascent republic and a symbol of its newly won freedom. So it commemorated the overthrow of the Etruscan monarchy. And the temple also served, in addition to its sacred functions, as an alternate meeting place for the Senate, a state archives, and a final destination for the triumphs that were staged in honor of victorious Roman generals and their armies. So they would parade through, um, through Rome, then through the Forum, and finally concluding this uh, triumphal parade in front of the Capitolium. So like the US Capitol, the Capitolium occupied an elevated and highly visible site within the city, as we can see from the model here. And it was embellished and enlarged as the nation state it represented grew in power, wealth, and territory. The idea of centrality was central to both structures. Okay, so this idea of being in the center um, is very important as in America, as we know from, of course, looking at L'Enfant's plan here, 
and this is uh, the area of the capital. Um, <clears throat> the location of the new federal cities was at the midpoint of the states that were uh, in 1791. And this is reiterated in the location of the capital itself, which as we see here stands at the midpoint of the four quadrants um, of the city. So in turn, uh, <clears throat> the uh, central space and innermost core of the capital is its rotunda. Originally envisioned as the site of a double monument to George Washington, this area of the capital we shall soon see pertains directly to the subject of apotheosis. And of course, this is the um, floor plan of the Capitol, which you all are familiar with anyway, in terms of the rotunda being the central structure. And just a note, you probably can't read it in the, um, the reproduction of L'Enfant's map here, but L'Enfant had re referred to the central structure only as the Congress House. Um, its designation as a as capital was primarily at the behest of Thomas Jefferson, and Jefferson, of course, um, his design for the Virginia State Capitol in Richmond would be the precedent there. Um, all other uh, state capitals referred to as state houses. So the word soon passed into wider use, as in the commissioner's call for a plan for, quote, a capital to be erected in this city, which of course then results in William Thornton's winning design. Um, on this note, Jefferson also famously referred to the Capitol as the first temple dedicated to the sovereignty of the people. And um, I have a really, uh, I think, very relevant quote from the Library of Congress on this topic, stating that, quote, in determining to construct a national capital rather than a Congress hall, Washington and Jefferson made it clear that they had in mind a national temple modeled on an ideals, idealized conception of the great temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus that stood atop the Capitoline Hill in ancient Rome. And these uh, references were certainly not lost on visitors. As early as 1804, one Irish visitor to the city referred to it as, quote, this modern Rome. So this point, this common point was recognized um, early on. So if there are any questions on the first two sections, Jane? Thank you so much, Deborah. A um, couple questions. One is, how would an artist judge how large or small to paint a figure knowing it's going to be viewed from 100 feet below. That has to do with the years of study. And certainly in Brumidi's case, he was very classically trained. He studied all aspects um, of uh, you know, the classical repertoire and vocabulary. And his knowledge of perspective um, was very finely tuned. So he really had all the skills that were necessary to be able to judge that, as we know from his fresco. So the next section is on apotheosis in ancient Rome, which is uh, obviously where we're starting with this. Um, so the meaning of apotheosis, it actually means the posthumous elevation of a mortal to the status of a god. And the derivation of the term is from the ancient Greek, and it's apos, meaning completely, theos, meaning God. So what happens um, is that apotheosis becomes a key feature of Roman statecraft once we enter the imperial period. Um, some individuals were apotheosized during the Republican era, but uh, it really becomes uh, a part of the, the state, um, it, the institution of government in the imperial period. And the reason for that being because at that point, 
Um, unlike uh, the Republican, uh, the way the government in Rome was set up, um, which had multiple uh, chief executives or consuls that were elected by the Senate, when we enter the imperial period, we have uh, a power invested in a single powerful individual, the emperor. So, so upon the death of an emperor, the Senate awarded the title of divus to emperors that were deemed worthy. And this was a judgment that was based on their military and civic service to Rome. So it was not an inherited privilege and it was also not granted to every emperor. And although he was never officially named emperor, the Julius Caesar was the first to be recognized as a god in a state cult. And uh, after which the Romans, quote, paid like honors to each emperor at his death if he had never reigned, if he had not reigned in a tyrannical manner or made himself odious. And there were, of course, a number of Roman emperors who made themselves odious in a variety of ways. So it's actually about half and half. Um, half of the Roman emperors were deemed worthy of apotheosis and half were not. Those that were not, um, many of them were actually damned and then uh, pretty much erased from public view. Their property could be uh, redeemed by the state, this sort of thing. Uh, their statues were the heads were taken off and replaced with a new head, et cetera, et cetera. So, <clears throat> yeah. Um, after decades of civil war following Caesar's death, uh, his nephew Octavian then assumed uh, the position of emperor and the title of Augustus in 27 BCE. And deified at his death, uh, Augustus was awarded an extremely elaborate uh, state funeral, and the climax of these funerals would be the lighting of the funeral pyre and the right of the eagle. And here you can see the, here's the funeral pyre, and then the eagle rises up to the sky with the smoke, and this was also commemorated on coinage, and we see here the eagle on the uh, reverse of this uh, silver, this denarius. So in the Roman world, apotheosis was commemorated in official monuments, statues, coinage, funeral rituals, and imperial cult temples. And all these were designed to glorify the deceased ruler and legitimize the power of the state by linking it to the divine favor of the gods. And now we're going to look at a couple of, well, one imperial monument. So this is our next section. So uh, we'll briefly examine one of these monuments, Trajan's Column, which is the best known and by the way, still fully intact um, example of a Roman honorific column functioning as both a commemorative and a funerary monument it combined narratives of Trajan's earthly deeds with imagery of his apotheosis. So the two details um, on the right side here uh, are from the reliefs that are on the shaft. And then this is where his statue originally uh, stood at the very top of the column. So height and elevation are really important in the, um, to the concept of apotheosis. And of course, this ties in with the right of the eagle that flies upward, bearing the emperor's uh, soul um, up to heaven. So um, on, on the shaft, um, then a continuous spiral frieze unscrolls from top to bottom, and it recounts his victorious campaigns in the Dacian Wars, while <clears throat> a gilded bronze statue of the emperor with an eagle once stood on the dome pedestal at the top of the column, but that was replaced in the 16th century with a statue of St. Peter. So together, 
these elements illustrate not just how he was deified, but why he was deified. And this is uh, a very important point. Again, going back to the fact that apotheosis, is, apotheosis was an award, was awarded by the Senate for meritorious deeds during life. So the inclusion of a burial chamber, which was down at the base of the column, um, containing the ashes of Trajan and his wife, made the ruler's journey from life to death to immortality, up top then, even more explicit. <clears throat> Tracing a trajectory from his tomb at the column's base to his earthly accomplishments on its shaft to the emperor's deified likeness overhead, the design of the column elevated its honoree literally and figuratively above the mortal world. In this way, the power and authority of the state vested in the person of the emperor is linked to that of the gods with whom he now resides. Like other official monuments of the period, Trajan's column delivers a powerful political message in concrete visual form. And just a note that the column was not a standalone monument. It was part of Trajan's forum. And here's where the column is located. And this, of course, is a conjectural reconstruction as well. Uh, based on uh, excavations. Uh, and so this is interesting in that the forum we know afforded uh, many different viewing perspectives. And art historian Diane Kleiner has noticed that, had, has noted that if you were entering into the forum through this triumphal arch, so you're in this large courtyard, or uh, here approaching the Basilica Ulpia, what you would have seen was just Trajan's statue hovering above, um, above these, these structures. And so you would, it was really suspended in a way, again, this, this idea of a floating or a hovering image, which is important to Brumidi's fresco so that you would look up and see this literally, um, you know, this, this heightened view of the apotheosized ruler um, in the sky. So, and this, of course, also re relates in Brumidi's case to Baroque, the Baroque ceiling designs that he references. And uh, those, of course, were picturing the ascension of Christ and other holy figures. Uh, Jane, were there any uh, questions on apotheosis in ancient Rome or Trajan's column before we go to the rotunda? Uh, yes, uh, two. two um, first, we love our audience. They give us the answers. Um, and so let me tell you about the Library of Congress. Um, okay, great. Yeah. The library was originally located on the west side of the Capitol. Uh, and mm -hmm. the, Steve tells us the floor plan that you showed was from the 1824 Capitol. The original Capitol plan from 1792 had the library over in the Senate wing. Uh, oh, okay. Right on, on that plan. And the one shown is the second location, which was added because Jefferson's library was too big for that location. Got so, it. Sorry, I misunderstood because I was looking at Lafon's plan. I didn't realize the question was in reference to the, the floor plan of the Capitol. So sorry about that. No worries. No worries. That's why we have <laughs> audience participation here. It's a great thing. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> um, but other question, we actually had Ellen Stanton and Steve both involved in that. Um, okay, great. If the apotheosis format could would be considered public art in Rome, mm -hmm. um, was the idea that the people would be inspired by the public art or was it just a way to revere the subject and that the people would look to the emperor? Well, I think very much both, um, actually, because certainly these, these monuments and um, 
you know, the other ways of commemorating apotheosis as well, like obviously, you know, coinage would be in very wide circulation. So these were very much meant to be in the public view and to really provide an example um, <clears throat> of, you know, how, uh, how one should serve the state of one's obligation you know, uh, as a citizen of Rome in this case. So they were very much, um, you know, examples of how to conduct oneself uh, in life and also a reminder, um, you know, of again, linking the state itself through the person of the emperor to divine favor, to show how Rome was favored by the gods. So definitely multiple functions. And is there uh, any place else in the United States where the apotheosis uh, method of honoring people is used? Well, we are going to see some other examples of apotheosis. They're not contemporary, but we're going to look at some examples um, before Brumidi from uh, the years following George Washington's death. So uh, right around 1800. Okay, we will hold on. Go. Okay, great. Make it to the next level. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Okay, so the next section is in the rotunda. Okay, so the adoption of the most celebrated of Roman temples, the Pantheon, as a primary model for um, the rotunda. We, we certainly know about that. It's been examined in depth, depth so that's, we will not revisit it here. Rather, what I want to do is to suggest, and these are suggestions um, only, several points of connection between the rotunda and Trajan's column that are related to the topic of apotheosis. So among the rotunda's intended functions as a grand vestibule, a hall of the people, a civic museum, and a ceremonial space, it was also conceived by the first architect of the Capitol, William Thornton, in concert with the rooms beneath it as a mausoleum for George Washington. Quote, a form of secular temple honoring Washington, including a tomb and a sculptural monument to be placed under the center of the dome. And this is what you're seeing here is Thornton's uh, sketch. And I have not seen anything more formal uh, <clears throat> than this, uh, but it may, perhaps the audience can inform me here um, of something I don't know. Uh, but it does give some sense um, of what Thornton had in mind, which from this little pencil sketch looks pretty much like a you know, fairly conventional uh, kind of monument. And then, of course, this is Thornton's plan uh, for the east elevation. And it does show the low dome um, based on the Pantheon that was originally planned. And I also put bullfinches. Um, this drawing and this plan was, was never uh, fully, was never executed. Um, but it does give you some sense with the first the lower dome of the Capitol, which was completed um, in the late the 1820s under Bullfinch's direction. Um, that of what we're looking at in terms of this center, this axis um, between the crypt in this case, and this of course is the rotunda floor, and then the dome itself. So this sort of central axis um, is important. So one significant point of connection between the rotunda and the column is then their common purpose, which would be the veneration of a national leader, the perpetuation of his memory, and its enshrinement within the body politic of the nation state. And of course, the idea of a monument honoring George Washington wasn't new. Uh, the Continental Congress had approved an equestrian statue um, back in 1783, and then L'Enfant, the plan that we looked at previously, um, had proposed placing the statue near the site of today's Washington Monument. 
monument, but in lieu of the outdoor location, Thornton called for, quote, a white equestrian statue centered in the rotunda of the Capitol's grand story with a grand re great repository located below. And one point of contention, of course, has been that Thornton never specified exactly what the great repository um, was supposed to be. And of course, in fact, below the tomb, uh, below the crypt, uh, the tomb was constructed, meant to hold Washington's uh, remains, which uh, were never uh, interred there. So it, it remains empty to this day. So although the domes raised over the Capitol in the 1820s and 1860s departed radically from Thornton's original design, so portions of that design can still be detected in the Capitol's center, central core, as seen in Thomas Hugh Walter's 1859 section drawing here on the left. Illustrating the alignment of tomb, should be down in the crypt. The rotunda statue site, which was meant to be here, and the dome, which of course is much enlarged, um, at this, or will be much enlarged. So we still have this same basic alignment envisioned by Thornton. And the vertical axis established by these elements still marks the physical and symbolic core of the capital. And again, in their original geographies, the federal city and the nation. So in accord with L'Enfant's plan, it delineates a sacred center. And here again, you have it. Um, that really is, is uh, symbolizing the uh, radiation of power outward from this, this monumental core, uh, ideally throughout the nation itself. And the Thornton 1793 plan specified the low hemispherical dome that we pointed out before modeled on the Pantheon, Walter's drawing shows how the raising of a new taller dome in the 1860s extended the vertical axis upward to accommodate uh, the apotheosis fresco on the dome's canopy and the Statue of Freedom on its exterior. So with these additions, so we're comparing the two side by side here. And what I'm suggesting is that with these additions, a sequence of spaces, imagery, and viewing perspectives, not unlike those of the column of Trajan can be detected. And I think, um, I'd like to thank uh, uh, AOC Curator Emeritus Barbara Lannan for suggesting that we think of this in terms of a poetic analogy uh, rather than a direct kind of reference. So <clears throat> this, um, this uh, axis again in both structures, so we see that a tomb on the lower level here and here, and um, <clears throat> We then proceed to the visual narratives of the honoree's earthly life, which would be the shaft of the column and the floor of the ground level of the rotunda. And <clears throat> to the next level, um, which of course is the dramatic vision of apotheosis hovering above. So while similarly tracing an honored leader's journey from life to death to deification, the capital reframes this narrative in terms of a civil religion that places freedom rather than an emperor at its apex. Crowning the nation's legislative seat, this allegorical figure, which is reproduced, here's the Statue of Freedom in both, in both contexts, um, both drawings by Walters, <clears throat> a civil religion that places freedom rather than an emperor at its apex, crowning the nation's legislative seat. This allegorical figure stands as a reminder that the importance of freedom 
surpasses that of any single individual. At the same time, no individual embodied that ideal so completely for 19th century Americans as George Washington. And while the shaft of Trajan's column re records his conquest uh, during the Dacian Wars, key events in Washington's military and civilian life are cataloged in the lower level of the rotunda. Here's one example of John Trumbull's four history paintings. George Washington resigning his commission was often, often singled out for particular approbation. Again, referencing the story of Cincinnatus, which we mentioned earlier, Trumbull's canvas represents the general's voluntary surrender of his military command as a worthy example or an exemplum virtutis of worthy of emulation by all citizens. So here, Trumbull's elevating Washington only slightly over the witnesses surrounding him at the Maryland State House. He's heroic, but he's not yet, he's still human, he's not yet ranked among the gods he will join above. So gazing upward, the viewer encounters a very different view of Washington enthroned in the heavens and he is flanked. Now we are to the allegorical figures. Um, <clears throat> by allegorical figures of fame or victory, and she is blowing her trumpet here. And this is the figure of liberty or authority, and she actually is wearing a Phrygian cap, which is hard to see from this, this angle. Um, <clears throat> and so they are just above uh, the arc of a rainbow, which obviously has symbolic meaning as well. And this dynamic sword wielding uh, figure of war is actually um, <clears throat> framed by groupings representing agriculture and science, which I cannot see the agriculture group, but here is the, the science group on the other side. And uh, she is, of course, echoing the Statue of Freedom on the exterior of the dome. So 13 maidens representing the 13 original states complete the inner circle of the fresco. Okay. And there are six addi additional groups that comprise the outer, outer circle, uh, allegorical groups. And as the Roman gods, Minerva, Ceres, Mercury, and Neptune mingle with historical figures, such as Ben Franklin and Samuel F. B. Morse in their mutual celebration of Washington and the nation's ascent to greatness. Ancient Rome is represented by Brumidi as the harbinger of modern America in the fields of science, technology, agriculture, and commerce. So Brumidi is, is very much um, underscoring this correspondence again between modern America and ancient Rome. Uh, no written record of how apotheosis was chosen as the fresco subject is known, but the inclusion of the watercolor sketch in Walter's drawing, which we just saw, suggests uh, that it may have been, whoops, here it is again, sorry, um, <clears throat> may have been determined by 1859 and in her book on Brumidi, Barbara Willannon also notes that, quote, the sketch could have been added in 1863 when authorization for the fresco was being questioned. But no doubt discussed extensively by Walter Brumidi and supervisor of the Capital Extensions, Montgomery Miggs, uh, apotheosis, I think, really could not have been a difficult choice. It was a space long devoted to memorializing uh, Washington, at least in theory, if not quite so much in practice, that and uh, this visual drama of the new rotunda soaring verticality was certainly suited to the theme of apotheosis that by 18, the 1860s had long been associated with Washington in the public imaginary. So we'll see in just a minute. Um, 
but I just wanted to mention um, that one of the primary models um, here, and certainly it was uh, a model Walter consulted for the design of the dome itself, but also the interior. And this is uh, the, the Pantheon in Paris, formerly the Church of St. Genevieve, and also the fact that this fresco of uh, the saint's apotheosis um, <clears throat> was on the canopy of the dome there as well. So a really dual inspiration in terms of the uh, design of, of the capital rotunda. As you looked at the Thornton's design of the tomb, was there an interaction between the apotheosis and the tomb and the figure on top of the spear of the tomb? Or is that a completely, who, who, was, who was the figure on the sphere of the tomb? I have not found really much of anything written about this little sketch. And I don't know who the figure was intended to be. So following Washington's sudden and very unexpected death in December of 1799, Americans seeking to honor him in words and images suited to the magnitude of the loss. It's really hard, I think, to overstate, you know, what an effect this had uh, nationally. Um, it was certainly a very traumatic event. So they turned again to the classical world to honor him in eulogies, sermons, biographical writings, and the many mock funeral processions that were staged during the national period of mourning um, which was from his death until then his birthday, the following February. The ancient concept of apotheosis was revived in a modern American context. So, um, apropos his iconic status, images of Washington were already in great demand during his lifetime. And this continued to fuel a booming print industry after his death. So we have two examples quickly. Uh, we'll have to look at them quickly of that. And Rembrandt Peel's interpretation of the theme on the left here is actually pretty straightforward. So we see Washington ascending to the heavens, the throne of billowing clouds, and he is illuminated by a beam of celestial light and crowned with a laurel wreath, which of course was the Roman symbol of victory. He's welcomed by the two revolutionary generals, Warren and Montgomery. And we see Mount Vernon, very small image of Mount Vernon there. So uh, the earthly home that he is leaving behind. Um, in contrast, Berlitz's uh, print um, of the apotheosis is much more uh, involved. Um, <clears throat> and we see uh, his, just an array of allegorical figures that he has included here, along with objects that are symbolic of Washington's uh, military and civic service to the, uh, to the nation. And we also see, of course, the eagle, and this entire ensemble is taken from the Great Seal of the United States. And so the eagle is looking upward, and I would like to think that um, it's directing, uh, you know, its gaze upward to enact its ancient role in the ritual of apotheosis, um, which we know was connected with it in ancient Rome. So <clears throat> hardening the, you know, we'll take a look. So this is the detail from uh, Barrelet's print that we just saw. Um, <clears throat> Hardening the facial contours of the of Gilbert Stewart's Anthenaeum portrait um, of George Washington that they derive from his rigid features resemble those of an apotheosized Roman emperor and we see Washington this transcendent gaze he is gazing towards eternity and this discarded hourglass to the left uh, of the, well, to our right, but to the left of the figure, um, really underscores his departure from the material world 
and entry into a higher timeless realm. And what's important to note here is that this, these, uh, the mask-like face and this transcendent abstracted gaze were understood very definitely in ancient Rome as signs of the apotheosized emperor's transformation from a human to a divine state. So this is definitely um, a very ancient iconography that's being continued here and also will be in later images of Washington by Horatio Greenell and of course, Constantino Brunetti. So, I think actually, well, I'll try. So while looking to classical, biblical, and monarchial models, um, artists reshaping apotheosis for American audiences could also look to more recent examples from revolutionary era France, bestowing immortal honors once reserved for emperors and kings on popular citizen heroes of the Enlightenment. Images such as to the genius of Franklin, which we see here, exemplify a democratizing trend echoed across the Atlantic. So we really see the idea of apotheosis now um, being applied to, uh, you know, to, in a more humanized kind of, of fashion, um, you know, to, to really make it more accessible to, uh, to popular audiences and also for very definite political reasons um, as well. So, and I'll just go ahead and try to finish up quickly and then if we do have questions at the end, so now specifically um, images of apotheosis at the Capitol prior to Bernini and we have Capilano's uh, early, uh, earlier relief panel, which we see here. But the most direct precedent um, was Horatio Greenow's uh, rather ill-fated uh, statue of George Washington which was installed in the center of the rotunda from 1841 to 43, and then removed to the Capitol's east front. And of course, it's in the Smithsonian um, now, the Museum of American History. So Greenow based his likeness on reproductions of the cult statue of Zeus or Jupiter from the temple at Olympia. And we can see this correspondence in the colossal scale, strict frontal pose, and to the chagrin of American audiences, partial nudity um, as well. Greenow's official commission specified that the statue's head was to be, quote, a copy of Udon's Washington. And uh, this, I did have to, there's a whole section on this in the book chapter, but uh, just for the sake of time, I had to eliminate it uh, today. But this, of course, is, is the most well-known um, image of George Washington, really, uh, for many years. Uh, <clears throat> Udon's famous statue that's now in the Virginia State Capitol in Richmond. And here is the bust of Washington that uh, was left at Mount Vernon and still is there today. So fixing the more fluid and expressive qualities of the early portrait into a mask-like visage and appending it to an equally rigid and partially new torso, Greenow fashioned a deified Washington with little appeal for most American viewers, such as the author Nathaniel Hawthorne who asked, quote, did anyone ever see Washington naked? It's inconceivable. He had no nakedness what was born with his clothes on and his hair neatly powdered. And this, of course, is the <clears throat> quotation that Grant Wood then is having so much fun with in his 1939 image of Parson Weems' fable. <clears throat> so Brumidi's apotheosis hovers immediately above the site of Greenhouse statue, which during its brief tenure in the capital occupied the spot on the rotunda's vertical axis chosen by Thornton as the site of Washington's equestrian monument. 
although Green Owl's likeness was no longer in situ when Brumidi undertook his own apotheosis, the later fresco nonetheless evokes its presence and the role it once played in constructing a meta-narrative of Washington's life, death, and apotheosis in the rotunda. To this end, Brumidi's portrait of Washington reproduces aspects of the statue most expressive of apotheosis. And this, of course, would be the immobilized face again, the abstracted gaze, and the strict frontal pose. However, Brumidi did change other details to meet the expectations of American viewers and no doubt aware of the criticisms that have been leveled towards the statue. Um, Brumidi clothed Washington, his upper torso in military uniform, but he did retain the toga-like garment that was draped over Washington's legs um, and made other minor modifications as well. While the colossal scale, iconographic complexity, and sheer technical skill of Brumidi's apotheosis continue to impress the rotunda's many visitors, the fresco's deeper significance lies, resides in its affirmation of the national unity symbolized by George Washington. Created in a time of civil war, it aligns, quote, Washington's unification of the political realm with his ability to invoke the unchanging order of the divine, equating his unifying force with that of the sacred center of the capital where his image is enshrined. So as in ancient Rome, his apotheosis fixed not only his place in the cosmic order, but that of the nation state that he represented. So Washington's apotheosis was, in a sense, America's apotheosis and a sign of the divine favor that both were believed to enjoy. So I think in this sense, and this requires further thought and research, certainly, I think we can connect the idea of apotheosis to the ideas of American exceptionalism and then uh, the doctrine of manifest destiny that will develop um, <clears throat> in the uh, 1830s and 40s. So the culmination of repeated attempts over many decades to realize Washington's symbolic presence on a monumental scale within the Capitol, Brumidi's fresco represents not only a vision of unity in another time of national division and trauma, but a final chapter in the long migration of apotheosis from ancient Rome to modern America and the rotunda of the U.S. Capitol. We've got a couple of final questions. Um, one of the um, interesting things that one of our questioners uh, pointed out is that, you know, in today's world, we would imagine complex planning about how would the, the apotheosis uh, fresco work and how would that work with the uh, Statue of Freedom over the top but at the time that this was all going on, it was perhaps more of a happy coincidence that it went together because the Capitol was built in, you know, a bit at a time and mm -hmm. that it wasn't quite the same as we might think of in today's world. Um, I, I, I would certainly, um, yeah, agree. Because, you know, as noted there, there never was really a comprehensive plan in terms of an interior, um, you know, scheme of decoration for the Capitol. So there is a bit of an ad hoc, you know, certainly, um, I guess, nature to, to the way in which it was done. Um, but at the same time, you know, as you said, we don't really have a written record of how apotheosis was decided on as the subject of the fresco. And again, you know, the ideas I was trying to present in terms of the correlation between the center section of the rotunda and Trajan's column, you know, that's really a suggestion or a conjecture on my part. But, you know, it all comes together um, in a way that 
perhaps to some extent is a happy accident, but I don't know. I mean, I would sort of like to think there's planning there that we don't really, we may not have a written record of it, um, but certainly, you know, Walter and, and Mix and Bermidi as well, were well aware, you know, of what had come before, both architecturally and in terms of, um, you know, the decoration of the Capitol. So they're well aware, you know, being part of this ongoing kind of process, I think, and their places in it. So in that sense, um, you know, maybe there's a bit more planning uh, than, you know, what it might sometimes seem. Well, I think maybe the other thing, and you spoke to it a little bit as you, as you were closing, that each element of the capital is part of the recognition that the capital is, um, as you identified early, uh, the first temple to democracy. Mm. And that the ideas and values of this country endure, and they get re identified in art and so it makes sense that whether it's the Statue of Freedom or the apotheosis or um, the ongoing discussion about the statues that we always are looking for how do we have uh, the Capitol represent uh, the best of American democracy. We have more questions than we can possibly answer. Um, so let me just ask one final question. You referred to uh, the book, um, that you were that you were referencing um, Roman influences on the art and architecture of the U.S. Capitol. Right. Um, is that a book that is available? Is it a book that is yet to be published? Um, some of our uh, some of our folks are are good readers and they want to know. Right. It is a book that is yet to be published. Um, the latest uh, timeline that we had from. Um, Don Kennan, uh, who is editing the book, is that it will be published in the spring of 2021. So a little less, less than a year now. So that's, it's still in the works, yeah. Got it. Um, and one final Civil War question. Uh, are Jefferson Davis and Alexander Stevens represented in the fresco? Uh, they are. The <laughs> Civil War? Yes, they are. You can't see them here in, in, you know, the images that are still up, but right. So they are below the figure of war. And so, you know, she is quite a dynamic figure who is kind of you know, <laughs> definitely battling against the, you know, the, the forces um, that are threats, you know, to the, the freedom, to what she represents. So yes, they are, they are there. They just can't be seen in this particular view. Right. Great. Well, Deborah Hansen, you are a wealth of knowledge and putting the apotheosis in context um, from Roman democracy to American democracy and the symbol that continues to go around the world. We appreciate your your time, your attention. We thank all of our uh, listeners for participating and look forward to you joining us for our next adventure.